but I want to talk very generally about how market microstructure works um, and how researchers think about markets and using these slides as a uh, mechanism for thinking about this. So let me share my screen and I believe I can share this. <clears throat> you should be able to see um, some slides here about uh, stock market crashes. Um, and I, there, I put the title of, of the slides as Understanding Market uh, Crashes, but I have a paper with Anu Vijayava that is uh, related to this, and I, I should have put her name on the cover uh, sheet uh, right here. Um, I'm not sure why I didn't, because um, these slides are really based on our joint paper. Although what I have, uh, am going to say uh, today is my own uh, thinking, which mostly agrees with her, but not 100% of the time on everything. Um, so stock market crashes are a really good uh, uh, a set of events to look at to try to understand how researchers approach issues uh, related to um, uh, to understand how uh, issues uh, researchers um, approach um, issues related to market microstructure. Um, and there are a, a, a lot of different market microstructure issues that show up in crashes. Um, so this first slide just points out some of them. Um, leverage is, is important. It, it will influence the dollar amounts that you want to trade. Um, some assets have more leverage in them than others. Um, the stock market we, we think of as being kind of unleveraged, but with full exposure to the markets. That is, we think of it as having a beta of one. You know, we think of call options and, uh, as typically having a beta of greater than one, so they have some built-in leverage. You have leverage ETFs, they also have uh, built-in leverage. Um, so we'll, we'll want to talk a little bit about leverage. Um, we'll also want to talk about the speed of portfolio adjustment. Um, I, I think that there are uh, two trends in market microstructure research that at least represent my thinking about market microstructure. Um, in 1985, I wrote a paper that uh, uh, had an informed trader and noise traders. And in the equilibrium in that model, it was a fully worked out uh, equilibrium um, that many people have used to do market microstructure research and to measure market liquidity. Um, and in, in that uh, paper, uh, this issue of how fast a trader adjusts their portfolio is dealt with in a kind of weird way. Um, on the one hand, the noise traders in that paper have an inventory that follows uh, a Brownian motion or follows a Martindale. And what does that mean? That means, uh, one way to think of that is that means that they adjust their portfolios instantaneously to whatever the target level is that they want. Um, and they do that every single period. So the speed of portfolio adjustment for the noise traders in that paper you can think of as being infinite. Um, on the other hand, they're not modeled as maximizing anything. So why, uh, why it's infinite is uh, something that uh, was left aside in that paper, but it turns out to be quite important. On the other hand, you have an informed trader in that paper and the informed trader chooses to um, adjust his portfolio slowly. But he, does, he doesn't have to adjust his portfolio slowly. He, he adjusts his portfolio slowly because that happens to sustain the equilibrium. It turns out that in that model, a, a informed trader doesn't really care how fast he adjusts his portfolio. Fast adjustment, slow to adjustment, doing it now, doing it later. All those generate the same expected profits. <clears throat> um, so speed of portfolio adjustment uh, goes back, uh, it, was, it was an important issue in, in my 87 paper. And it, it's also the case that in, when the, uh, in that paper, when the uh, portfolios adjust, the prices adjust proportionally with the portfolios. So um, the price is a linear function of the noise trading. Since the noise trading is a martingale, that's adding a martingale component to prices. Um, the uh, trading of the uh, informed trader is uh, got, uh, it's, it's kind of autocorrelated over time. You know, over short periods of time, the autocorrelation is approximately one. Um, many people find it counterintuitive, but even so, the uh, sum of the trading by the informed trader and the trading by the noise trade traders in that model, which represents the position opposite of the position taken by the market makers in that model, the, the sum of those uh, uh, positions is proportional 
uh, to the price, meaning that that as the as the noise trader and inform traders change their their positions, the price instantaneously changes in a, in a linear manner. Um, so we'll talk about speed of portfolio adjustment, but why do I put that here? Well, there's another line of research that I've been involved in more recently uh, that I call smooth trading. And this is uh, not the idea that prices adjust immediately to quantities, but rather there's a lead lag relationship. And most people would think, and I think incorrectly, that the lead lag relationship would be that prices adjust slowly. But we find that the equilibrium is the opposite. The equilibrium is that the prices adjust instantaneously, but the quantities people trade um, adjust slowly. So um, that's another way of thinking about how uh, prices respond to quantities traded. And it turns out to be, I think, very important for thinking about market microstructure. In many ways, it makes a lot of things in, in market microstructure easier, um, but it especially makes understanding crashes easier and it potentially helps us differentiate between some different types of crashes uh, that I'm gonna talk about. Okay, this third bullet point says information, um, that both public and private information are potentially important. Uh, it's certainly the case, <laughs> and, and it's certainly the case that private information is important in financial markets. And we think that private information is related to the adverse selection that may be important in uh, determining market liquidity. So we'll be uh, talking about that. And then finally, we're gonna be talking about liquidity. And this is uh, a complicated topic. So if you're, if you're um, it, it is, it's complicated at the very, very beginning when you first start thinking about it. Um, you know, many people will, will want to ask the question of is market liquidity a priced factor? Well, maybe market liquidity is just a function of the characteristics of the market. And we think, as Anu Bajayevan, I think, that market liquidity is a function of dollar volume and returns volatility. Um, so if, if uh, <clears throat> market liquidity is a price factor, that would mean either that dollar volume or returns volatility or both are price factors with some positive or uh, negative sign. Um, but more important, it raises the question of, you know, when you try to think about adverse selection, how do you think of adverse selection? Do you think of adverse selection as related to liquidity? Or do you think of adverse selection as related to, let's say, a volume or volatility, more likely volatility? Um, you know, if you, uh, so that's something else to uh, think about. And I, I, you know, I, I, I think we have been thinking about these issues for more than 30 years. The stock market crash of 1987 was 33 years ago. We've been thinking about these things for 33 years. I don't think we've gotten very far. Um, but I think we're making some progress now and we're gonna probably make some progress in the next few years. Um, so um, I, I wanna emphasize um, that uh, th there's a concept that uh, we call rebalancing and deleveraging, that understanding this is very important to understanding uh, leveraged ETFs. So um, let me just describe the intuition that many people have and what's right about it and what's wrong about it. So many people have uh, intuition that, let's say if I have a, a call option uh, as, a, um, as, a, as a position in the market, many people have the intuition that that call option has leverage built into it. And the, uh, that is correct. The call option does um, have leverage uh, built into it. And then many people also uh, have an understanding that because it has leverage built into it, uh, if I don't actually have a call option, but I want the return that I would get if I had a call option, and I'm trying to replicate that return by engaging in a dynamic trading strategy along the lines of Black-Scholes, many people have the intuition that I'll buy when prices go up <clears throat> and I will sell when prices go down. That intuition is also correct. And it turns out when we start talking about crashes, it was very important for understanding what was going on in the 1987 stock market crash because there was this trading strategy called portfolio insurance uh, where the uh, asset managers or the clients were trying to mimic the payoffs on, on f fairly gigantic portfolios of call options or gigantic positions of call options on the market portfolio. And they were uh, <clears throat> implementing this by engaging in dynamic trading strategies of buying when prices go up and selling when prices go down. Um, now, people also have a kind of opposite intuition that uh, is related to the capital asset pricing model and it's related to diversification and it's uh, often called rebalancing. And according to that intuition, 
um, you have a, an optimal portfolio uh, and your optimal portfolio is uh, weights on, on various stocks and the stocks start changing or weights on various positions. These positions are changing in value as the markets go up and down. Um, the, as the market goes up and down, of course, the weights are changing. So for example, let's take the two asset example that's simplest of cash on the market. Um, if I want to be 60% in the market and 40% cash, uh, then, um, which might be the example that's worked out here, but you can uh, ignore the math for now. Um, if I want to be 60% uh, uh, invested in the market and 40% in cash and the market goes up, well, now I'm more than 60% invested in the market and cash hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and so what I need to do to maintain my target portfolio allocation is I need to sell some stock. And so many people have this intuition that a rebalancing strategy is kind of the opposite of a, um, uh, of a momentum strategy. The momentum strategy is something that you, you do when you're replicating the payoff on an option because you have leverage. And the rebalancing strategy is something you do in the context of portfolio rebalancing. So all of that is correct. <coughs> what, what people often don't understand is that these two ways of thinking about trading are exactly the same. The only difference is the value of the parameter, which on this slide is beta. In the, uh, in the um, rebalancing example, the fraction of stocks beta uh, would be like uh, 60%. Um, and that's a number between zero and one. Well, as long as beta is between zero and one, your strategy will be a strategy of rebalancing. On the other hand, if beta is greater than one, um, your strategy will be a strategy of momentum trading. Um, and that's what you get when you're trying to replicate the payoff on a call option. Um, well, you might ask, well, is there such a thing as beta being less than zero? Um, well, the answer is yes, there is. And if beta is less than zero, um, you also get this momentum uh, strategy that is uh, similar to the, what you get with um, pay, replicating the payoff on a call option. And you can see this when you think through the logic of how a leveraged ETF works. Uh, recall that in a leveraged ETF, the ETF tries to maintain um, a certain exposure to the market or, or a certain exposure to an underlying benchmark. Think of it as the market. So it tries to keep the beta constant. This means that the leveraged ETF has to trade every day. Um, if the market goes up, does the leveraged ETF buy or sell? Well, the answer is that if they have leverage greater than beta greater than one, they buy, it's momentum trading. If it was a kind of deleveraged ETF, um, which many target date retirement funds are kind of deleveraged ETFs, then theoretically they should be um, rebalancing, engaging in a stabilizing strategy. And if it's a short ETF or a leveraged short ETF, then beta is less than zero. And the logic of this says that they should also be engaging in a momentum strategy. Um, so uh, understanding this uh, might be important for understanding potential crash scenarios. It might be important for uh, understanding certain market microstructure issues. And uh, I think it's something many people don't quite understand. Um, so um, the, uh, uh, I, I'm pointing it out right here, even if uh, I don't use it uh, too much in the uh, rest of the paper. Um, so uh, in market microstructure research, I already said that I think my 85 paper um, suggests that traders, uh, that the prices are linear functions of the inventories of the traders who are not market makers. And they're also, also by market clearing, the linear function, same linear function um, of the market makers inventories multiplied by minus one. Um, but uh, the, uh, the speed with which rebalancing occurs or the speed with which trading occurs uh, based on my recent research, but also I think based on the way um, empirical models uh, sometimes work, um, that different uh, rates of trading over different horizons can contribute to crashes. But if it can contribute to crashes, it suggests that it's something intrinsic to the market microstructure and something that we should be uh, thinking about when we try to understand how markets work. So for example- Pete, uh, Peter, real, uh, a quick question. Uh, yeah. At some point, it would be great uh, to hear your thoughts on you know, how after the 87 crash, circuit breakers were put in. And uh, yesterday, Stacey Cunningham in her uh, keynote speech, she was talking about how the markets have worked really well, which uh, I completely agree with. 
but she's also talking about how circuit breakers need some tweaking. It would be great to get your thoughts at some point on what, what, what tweaking do you think they need? Okay, well, this is a fantastic question. I think I'll just address it for a while right now because I was making the 87 crash the theme of this. Um, <laughs> so I actually worked as a staff member for the Brady Commission, which uh, studied the stock market crash of 87 and developed recommendations that um, uh, didn't necessarily get put into uh, effect immediately. But I'll, I'll tell you a few things that I, I learned uh, when I was working for the Brady Commission. And uh, I'll tell you a few of my kind of reactions to the uh, uh, environment in which uh, everything was taking place um, at that time. So um, the, uh, when the stock market crash of 1987 occurred, um, many people were very suspicious of index arbitrage. They thought that index arbitrage was some type of speculation and it was some kind of uh, destabilizing trading and it involved short sales and there's something, uh, something immoral or unethical about short sales. And so there was a lot of suspicion about index arbitrage. And the, uh, this thinking to me is deeply ingrained in human nature. It goes back thousands of years. Um, you will see it in uh, probably villages in India, when there's a famine, people will uh, think that somebody's speculating in the local food supply. And if you go back into uh, the 15th, 16th, 17th century in England, um, there were all kinds of restrictions on the way you could trade grains. And these were based on uh, people fearing uh, uh, what, what we would generally call speculation, but what they did is they lumped speculation and arbitrage together. And there were different types of arbitrage that uh, traders could engage in. One type of arbitrage is uh, through time, another one is through location. So in the time context of stocks, um, it would be arbitrage uh, between uh, uh, stocks over time, uh, keeping prices aligned together and index arbitrage is a good example of that. But another type of arbitrage would be pairs trading, you know, where it's kind of cross-sectional um, across stocks. So the, um, the Brady Commission um, was uh, concerned about this anti-market thinking that was very suspicious of index arbitrage. And they were uh, trying to propose market reforms that essentially would make uh, index arbitrage politically acceptable because there was nothing really wrong with it. It should be uh, politically um, acceptable. And the reforms that they were proposing uh, largely were related to having some kind of circuit breakers so that markets didn't, uh, didn't just completely fall apart um, when uh, there was a big order flow imbalance uh, that was appearing to uh, lead to the stock market crash. Um, but um, I, wanted, I want to mention a few other little uh, empirical details. Um, it, you know, back then, in 1987, uh, you didn't have what we call the TAC data in the, in the same form as you have it today. But you did have a regulatory mandate that required that the stock exchanges publish every single price and every single quantity and every single bid and every single offer. So there was a, um, <laughs> essentially a ticker tape, what we would call a ticker tape, but a, a, a record of everything that was happening in the stock market, theoretically disseminated uh, more or less in real time. And the logic for, for it uh, was that the SEC would need these data to study the markets and help them uh, per perform better. One of the things that I learned was that nobody at the SEC could actually read the tapes that these data were stored on. So even though it was regulatory data required to be reported to this, I said, may have said CFTC, I meant to say SEC, uh, that even though nobody could, uh, uh, even though the, the data were required to be reported to the SEC, um, nobody at the SEC could actually um, read these data and uh, understand what was going on in the stock market. Um, in 1987, in the futures market, it was totally the opposite. Um, the futures exchanges not only uh, uh, had the data available and had it available essentially instantaneously, or you know, at least on a daily basis, and not only could they give it to the exchanges um, if they could work out an arrangement to give it to them, but the data were very good. The CFTC, the, excuse me, the, the uh, futures exchanges, the CBOT and the CME, uh, they, they had audit trails that were pretty good audit trails um, even back in 1987. 
So um, when the crash of 87 occurred, it was very easy to figure out what happened in the futures market. Um, it was required a bit more work to figure out what happened in the stock market. Um, and we, we put together, uh, nevertheless put together uh, estimates of how much index arbitrage there was, which we could measure by looking at uh, certain customers who are index arbitragers, were they buying in the futures or selling in the uh, stock market? And we put all those estimates together and we found that the numbers added up in exactly the way that you would predict based on rational um, markets uh, working well. But <laughs> I think that, and the, the Brady, so the Brady Commission, uh, it recommended having an audit trail, if I remember correctly. Uh, we still haven't gotten the audit trail, but we're getting closer, you know, it's after 33 years. Um, they uh, recommended that uh, index arbitrage be monitored and measured and that everything be watched so that data be collected. Um, and certainly we're way, way, way better now than we were back then. They're experts at the SEC, you know, as well, of course, as the CFTC, but they're experts at the SEC who um, it, it can examine the data that's uh, publicly available uh, fairly, um, uh, regu uh, f fairly rigorously. Um, but the issue of, um, the, the issue of whether you should have trading halts or price limits or how those should operate has remained an, an issue that's important for market microstructure, but I think has never been dealt with in a completely um, uh, closed manner that allows us to think, okay, now we've uh, figured out how to solve this. So let me, uh, let me just leave that one open and uh, let, we'll come back to it um, a little bit later if I, if I have time, because uh, th there may be some, uh, some slides in here about, um, uh, about that. Um, so uh, this is, let me return now to the speed of rebalancing. Um, different trading horizons can kind of contribute to crashes. I, I wrote a paper that was, uh, back after the 87 crash, it was kind of a thought paper that suggested that one of the problems that, that occurred that, that led to the crash is that when the market went, when the uh, portfolio insurers needed to uh, uh, sell because their market was going down and their signals required them to do momentum trading, uh, they were trying to sell you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of stock. But the rebalancers, which are, would be essentially much of the pension fund industry, um, they, they had targets for how much they wanted in uh, equity and how much they wanted uh, in debt. Uh, if the market collapsed, they would want to buy a lot of equity. And if you looked at the quantities the rebalancers would want to buy, I didn't see a mismatch between the quantities that the balance rebalancers would want to buy and the quantities that the portfolio insurers would want to sell. But where I did see a mismatch was in the time horizon over which they would be implementing uh, the rebalancing strategy or the portfolio insurance strategy. So the portfolio insurers like to update their portfolios on a daily basis. And as in practice, that meant they were maybe one or two days behind, but that would mean that they would try to get to their target inventory every day. And if maybe they didn't get there today, they would get there tomorrow. But if you're a pension fund rebalancing, um, the uh, rebalancing would take place over very long periods of time. You'd have meetings of the, uh, the board of the fund and you would uh, set targets and you would adjust those targets and then you would decide to make a change. And it would take many months or even quarters before they would uh, be able to implement those changes. So this, this I thought this, um, mismatch in horizons over which traders trade contributed to the crash of 87 and of course pr would predict that the crash would occur because the rebalancers were not there on the day of the crash and it would predict that the market would come back eventually as the rebalancers uh, rebalanced. Um, so <coughs> we recovery from the crash uh, took, took many months I think because of the speed with which rebalancing occurred. Um, by the way, if you ask, okay, if the, port, if the pension funds were not buying on the day of the uh, crash of 87, who was buying? Somebody had to be buying, right? Because markets cleared. And part of the answer to that question is hedge funds. Um, you know, we didn't have as big a hedge fund industry back then as we have today. Maybe that ex explains to some extent why it fell so much. But um, uh, I, I don't necessarily think that's, that's correct either. But I do think that the hedge funds were the ones that were buying uh, back in those uh, days. Um, so uh, let, let's keep on talking about um, 
the different uh, issues that we need to think about in order to relate market microstructure uh, to crashes. Um, there are all kinds types of information that markets might process. It could be fundamental information, information about what other people are doing that would include corners and squeezes, macroeconomic policy information. So, uh, you know, uh, a particular bank regulation might have uh, huge implications uh, for various industries. Um, you, you've seen this uh, in the past. Uh, uh, if you think about the history of Argentina, um, you saw the uh, Swiss government breaking the currency peg. You saw the Fed, I'd say, breaking the Hunt Brothers silver corner in 1980 by restricting um, access to credit uh, to the Hunts. And you saw um, during the COVID crisis, you've seen the government um, essentially prop up the bank with all kinds of, but the banking system with all kinds of indirect uh, subsidies, which ultimately were kind of subsidies to the bank's customers. And these policies essentially become important information that will influence the value of uh, uh, companies. So, you know, so what is a, an airline worth? What is an airline uh, airplane manufacturer worth? Um, what is a hotel chain worth? Well, um, it might be that they, without any government subsidies, the, the value would be zero. And so the val whatever the value is, it's just a present value of the government subsidies. Um, so, well, at any rate, um, I've talked about my, a uh, little bit about my 85 paper where I said that price impact has, I'm gonna call it, change, change terminology here, and I think this is the right terminology, but I'm gonna call uh, what goes on in my 87, uh, 85 paper, um, permanent price impact. So if we think of the price today, and we ask how, how does the price today depend on my trading? Um, so think of I'm a, a potentially reasonably big trader. I have some price impact. I might wanna manage my price impact. Um, and that requires my thinking about how prices respond to my trading. Well, <laughs> if I sit at home and do nothing and just watch the market, um, I'll call the price that I get P0. That's the price that uh, we see in the market in the absence of my trading at all. So, um, and, but then I can trade. If I trade, my trade, I, I call it Q here, but Q is really a function of time. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm uh, Q is actually my inventory here. So uh, it's a function of time that we could have called Q of T. And so what this says is that my, impact on price is uh, lambda, it's got two components, lambda times Q and then another component. Uh, this lambda times Q component is saying that for every share I have bought in the past, the price is lambda dollars per share higher. Um, and the lambda you can think of as one way to try to measure liquidity. It's got weird units. It's not the, the great, greatest way to measure liquidity, um, but, but it um, is one way to measure liquidity. But we call the lambda Q term permanent price impact because it doesn't depend on how fast or how slowly I acquired my position or when I acquired it. It only depends on how much of a position I've acquired. So if I own a million shares of, of a company stock, I've made the price higher. I've made the price higher by uh, dollars per share equal to lambda times a million shares. And that uh, that's my permanent price impact. But in addition to that, and that's the way my 85 paper works, that, that the price responds instantaneously to every adjustment in my inventory. That's what happens here. If I change my inventory by delta Q, the price changes by lambda times delta Q. So it's inst instantaneous adjustment, but it's permanent price impact in the sense that it's a function, of my, the price is a function of how much I've already bought. Now, another way of thinking about price impact is to think about uh, what we call temporary price impact. And that is to say that the, uh, the price in the market, my effect on the price in the market is not just a function of how much I've bought cumulatively over time, but it's a function of uh, how fast I'm buying now. And what you, could, you could have a much more general version of this, but equation one is I think the simplest uh, way to go beyond <clears throat> having a simple lambda Q term here. And so what this says is if I'm buying aggressively in the market today, then I am pushing prices up um, uh, while I am buying. And if I stop buying tomorrow, I'm not pushing prices up tomorrow anymore, so prices will drop back down 
to what they would have been if I'm uh, just holding my position Q and have the permanent impact that was the first term there, um, but I'm not having what we call the temporary price impact, which is the second term, uh, DQ, DT. So what this says is that if you compress your trading into a very short period of time, then what will happen is that you will have a very large short-term impact on prices, but when you uh, stop trading, the DQ, DQT goes back closer to zero, that short-term price impact or temporary price impact will reverse itself and the price will go back to P0 plus lambda Q, an, an amount that just represents long-term price impact. <coughs> so we think this is an important, this uh, temporary price impact is, is very important for understanding certain aspects of crashes, but it's also very important for uh, understanding perhaps some other puzzles in market microstructure that relate to um, the price impact of trading. Um, so I'm not going to make this a talk about invariance, even though the, that we've written a paper on stock market crashes and we're trying to use invariance to um, explain stock market crashes. But Anna Obajayev and I have developed a um, theory that we call market microstructure invariance. And what we, uh, in a nutshell, try to do is summarize in equations two and three. Um, equations two says we're trying to develop a measure of liquidity that's empirically implementable. And equation three says we're trying to use that measure of liquidity to uh, uh, describe a very specific model of transactions costs, and that would be equation three. But our measure of liquidity <laughs> is equation two. And it, you can think of equation two as an alternative to Anihut's illiquidity measure. So uh, illiquidity L is what we use to describe liquidity. So uh, what we would call illiquidity is uh, one over L, which is uh, kind of comparable in many ways to what Amihud uh, would uh, refer to as his illiquidity measure. Um, but this, this uh, liquidity measure that we came up with is really weird uh, to many people, but yet it solves a lot of very fundamental problems. So let me uh, just let us stare at equation two for a few minutes and uh, I can talk about uh, what problems it, it solves. Um, and so let's step back to square zero and ask what we're trying to do as market microstructure researchers. Well, the first thing we're trying to do is we're trying to be scientists. Um, well, what does being a scientist mean? Being a scientist means having concepts that we can connect uh, to data, but that are also precisely described. So if I have a concept like liquidity or trading volume or trading costs or uh, 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 volatility, these uh, concepts should be implementable. And the first step in implementing them is to think about what their units should be. So for example, um, and we, we often see uh, fin finance people are not very consistent um, when they think about units. Uh, so we often see like mistakes being made uh, implicitly, or at least uh, we see corners being cut. Um, so if we sit back and think about it um, in finance, um, many of the concepts that we have have units of time associated with them. So for example, an interest rate is uh, an interest rate, let's say per year. Uh, so it's an annual interest rate, <coughs> but it's definitely got uh, time units associated with it. Um, you will, if you look, you don't have to look very hard, but you, uh, if you look, you'll often see something like, one over one plus R to the nth, where uh, you're discounting a cash flow for N periods, where R is the interest rate, uh, and N is the number of, uh, N is the number of years or periods that you're uh, discounting the cash flow. Now, if you think about it, that doesn't make any sense because what you're doing is adding R to one. And I just said that R has time units. One doesn't have time units, one is just the number one. You can't add a number with time units to the number one. So writing one over one plus R to the nth power in some sense is nonsensical. So how do you fix that? Well, it's easy enough to fix. You just change the R to R times delta T. And uh, I just, uh, in my example, was assuming that the time period we we're talking about was a year. So the correct way to fix it would be to not say one over one plus R to the nth power, but one over one plus R times delta T to the nth power. Um, and delta T in this case might be one year. 
but it could be um, any, uh, it could be whatever the appropriate time uh, period is. Well, that's the precise and correct way to, um, that's the precise and correct way to, um, uh, uh, to get the units right in finance when we're talking about interest rates. Um, so now the question is, uh, how do we measure market liquidity? What should the units be? And the units, a lot of people would say, well, you can measure, let Lambda from ID5 paper be a measure of market liquidity. It's a measure of price impact. Well, Lambda has really weird units. Um, you know, Lambda is, is the price impact in dollars per share of trading one more share of stock. So it actually has units of dollars per share squared. Um, well, these are kind of weird units. <laughs> so don't we need something that has less weird units? And the, uh, there, there are different ways that you could think of measuring liquidity, but one way to measure liquidity is to think of it as a dimensionless number. And if it's a dimensionless number, it maps into the way people on Wall Street think about liquidity because they typically measure trading costs and basis points. And so if they were to say stock index futures are a very liquid way to trade the market, what they're really thinking is that I can trade millions of dollars and I'll have a price impact of one basis point. So they're thinking of a dimensionless measure of uh, liquidity. Um, you might ask them also, um, what if I trade, <coughs> I want to buy a, a block of stock? Well, I might uh, buy it by being 5% of trading volume for a whole day. And if I am, then, uh, then I'll have a, a certain uh, price impact. That price impact might be 20 basis points. So either way, they're measuring essentially liquidity um, in basis points. And so what we decided was we needed a, a measure of liquidity that was dimensionless that you could think of as basis points. And so we've, we've came up with this measure that turns out to, to map into basis points um, almost perfectly. Uh, there, of course, there needs to be a scaling constant, but the scaling constant is just this number m squared here, which is, which is um, for our purposes today, is just a constant. So what, is this, uh, what does this say? This says that, <coughs> In the numerator, it says that you've got returns variance multiplied by the cost, uh, a cost no a number C. The invariance theory goes into a great deal about where C comes from, but the bottom line for our purposes today is that C is measured in dollars. So we can think of it as, one way to think about it is something like the cost of information. Um, but another way of thinking about it is, is, is uh, related to dollar price impact costs, which uh, is a less good way to think about it because then you're kind of uh, using, uh, using something related uh, to adverse selection to explain something related to adverse selection. So, so let's think of C as the cost of information. That's the cost in dollars uh, for a unit of information. Sigma squared is returns variance. Well, we tend to be very care careless when we uh, think about uh, returns variance, forgetting sometimes that the units of returns variance are the same as the units of an interest rate. That is, it's per, uh, the units are per time, one over T, you might say. Um, or per day, one over a day. That's why when you multiply R by delta T, you get a dimensionless number. And also why when you multiply sigma squared by delta T, you get a dimensionless number. Um, now, this is kind of interesting because if sigma squared has units uh, per time, sigma has units per square root of time. Many people find that puzzling, but it's uh, not puzzling at all. It uh, explains why when we go from an annual variance to a daily variance, we divide by the square root of, of the number of days in a year and don't divide by the number of days in a year. Um, so at any rate, the, the uh, numerator here has units of uh, dollars per time or dollars per day. If we look at the denominator, M is gonna be a dimensionless number that we can forget about. And we have PV, well, P is the price of the asset in dollars per share. V is the volume in shares per day. So PV is, is the dollar volume measured in dollars per day. Well, guess what? The uh, units of the denominator, dollars per day, are exactly the same as the units of the numerator, dollars per day. And so when we take the ratio inside these big parentheses, we get a dimensionless number. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we call that dimensionless number um, one over L. And we think that liquidity should be a function of uh, this particular dimensionless number. And also we think that um, we've scaled it in such a way so that it actually does measure something. Um, so that's our invariance theory. Um, and it's, it's partially developed right now. It applies very nicely to understanding lambda Q. 
we're still it's still work in progress to understand which is the permanent price impact still work, work in progress to get it to uh, to understand how it uh, works with temporary price impact um, but we're working on it and we think that this can be done um, and it's a, an interesting frontier um, for research at any rate um, we we think that given that you've figured out this quantity L, then you can uh, think of the cost of trading Q shares of stock in basis points as being one over L times some function of PQ, which is the dollar size of the quantity you want to trade, and divided by CL, <coughs> where C is this uh, dollar uh, cost. So L shows up twice in equation three. Um, all right, let me uh, keep on going. And, uh, and just say there are lots of different ways uh, to think about uh, invariants and lots of uh, papers that I've been working on in market microstructure. Um, so our, our first invariance paper was a, a paper in, in Econometrica. Our second paper that's related to the smooth trading is a paper in the view of economic studies. Um, you, you know, this being a finance conference, you might ask why are these in economics journals? And part of the answer to that is my co-author Anna Bajayeva is in an economics department effectively, even though they have finance, they're, they're organized like an economics department. Um, and uh, third of all, um, the third uh, example here is uh, this paper itself, Large Bets and Stock Market Crashes, which is you can go on to get a, a version of this paper, you can go to SSRN and look for Large Bets and Stock Market Crashes. Um, and then, <coughs> And there's some of my older research that's relevant to this. In particular, my 85 paper that I've talked about before and the Rudy Economic Studies paper, um, which I haven't talked about yet, but I may um, say uh, say something about um, as we go along. So <coughs> we, we think that all of these five papers are consistent with the way asset managers think and trade. So we think that these papers provide a roadmap for mapping the way markets work <clears throat> into the way asset managers uh, think about how markets work. And uh, essentially our papers agree with the way asset managers are, are thinking about these things. Um, all right, uh, let me, uh, I'm gonna sk skip uh, all this discussion of invariance. I gave you a discussion of L um, and I gave you a discussion of smooth trading. Um, and I'm gonna talk for a minute about um, where to, really, this is where to draw the line between market microstructure and uh, macroeconomics. Um, so uh, some things that I think of as being market microstructure, other people think of as being macroeconomics. Uh, this is uh, particularly uh, the case when you start talking about uh, liquid, liquidity of the banking system. Well, to me, liquidity is a microstructure concept. But when we say liquidity of the banking system, many macro people will think of that as a macroeconomic concept. Um, but when you apply this to crashes, there are, um, there's a distinct kind of empirical pattern uh, that you see. Um, one, uh, one type of event that you see is essentially the collapse of a country's banking system. Uh, when the banking system collapses, typically the public finances are in a state of shambles. The exchange rate is also collapsed. Um, there is a, uptick in inflation that might be uh, very severe depending on the time period you're looking at. And it takes a long, long time to recover from this. So <coughs> the uh, financial crisis of 2008 looked like uh, a banking crisis. And if you look at emerging markets, many of the crises that you see um, look like uh, banking crises. Um, but then, and these banking crises are, are often accompanied by very severe recessions, very steep declines in the stock market that might, depending on how microscopically you look at it, might look like a stock market crash. Um, and we think that these types of events are, that are more macroeconomic in nature are different from the stock market crashes that our paper on crashes is, is about that I'll talk about in a second, um, that these are, <coughs> um, crashes where it is the market suddenly declines in value, um, but there's no recession, there's no uh, collapse in the banking system. Uh, there doesn't have to be a currency uh, collapse, although it might be a currency collapse because it could be that the crash is in the currency, um, or it could be a reverse crash like, like a 
the Swiss franc skyrocketing in value. You can think of that as every other currency in the United States, uh, every other currency in the world collapsing um, and, or, and crashing, which would be true from the perspective of somebody sitting in Switzerland. Um, but uh, the stock market crashes seem to be generated not by whatever generates a banking crisis, but they seem to be generated by the way trading, uh, or potentially are generated by the way trading occurs in the market. Um, and so I, uh, we think that the, these are what we would call market microstructure crashes. Um, and, the, and the 87 crash is a perfect example of a, of a market microstructure crash because there wasn't a recession in 87. The banking system was not in trouble. Uh, the economy was actually doing quite well. The stock market was kind of at a pretty high level. And then all of a sudden, the uh, market crashed by 20, 30, 40 percent um, over a period of a, a few days, you know, more than 20 percent of it on Monday, October the 19th. Okay, um, so we call these market crashes triggered by bets. And the paper that looks at crashes um, looks at five crashes, um, and, but there are three of one type and two of another. So the th there are three crashes that we think of as being triggered by gi gigantic uh, bets executed over a short period of time, like a few days. <clears throat> um, so th in the 1929 crash, um, many, uh, you know, well, let me ask, uh, uh, let me uh, discuss for a minute, what is a bet? Well, a bet is, uh, if it could be a decision by an asset manager to buy or sell a big chunk of uh, uh, of a, uh, a big stake in a in a company, um, you know, let's buy a million shares or hundred thousand shares or ten thousand shares of stock in, in a particular company. Um, but and we'll call that a bet. To, to be a bet, we would think of it as having to be somewhat uncorrelated, not necessarily perfectly uncorrelated because that's inconsistent with market clearing. But it would have to be somewhat uncorrelated with. Um, uh, uh, with with all the other trading that's taking place in the market, that is all the other bets. Um, on the other hand, another type of bet might be many small investors all kind of trading in the same direction at the same time for the same reason. <clears throat> so in 1929, and I think in in China, a few years ago it was the same thing. Uh, you you had traders getting margin calls. The market went down. Traders got margin calls. The margin uh, calls resulted in a massive liquidation of positions. And uh, that uh, precipitated uh, the crash of 1929. And so we'll think of the big bet there as being the uh, liquidation of the margin uh, positions. <coughs> In 1987, um, we got um, the 1987 crash. And there we had portfolio insurers who were buying and selling stock index futures, but they were buying when prices went up and selling when prices went down to mimic the payoff on a um, option, uh, a position. And in 1987, the, um, the, the uh, bets the portfolio insurers made, like I said previously, were executed fairly quickly. You know, they would like to have done it in one day, but maybe in a big uh, situation, they would stretch it out over two or three days. Um, but still, that's reasonably prompt. And another example of a potentially big crash that I think is hugely important and gets almost no attention. Like the flash crash gets a huge amount of attention. The flash crash is not very important. <clears throat> this one was hugely important and it gets almost no attention at all. Um, and that was the uh, liquidation of Jerome Curviel's trades by Societe Generale in January 2008. So what had happened is a rogue trader had put together um, a position of like 60 billion euros, a long, naked long speculative position, and then appears to have hit, hit it from people inside the bank. So the bank did not know that he had this position on. Uh, and then he got caught, and the bank had to liquidate the $60 billion position. So that meant, and they were, the regulator gave them three days. So again, the time frame is very similar to the 187 market crash, and also kind of similar to a 1929 crash, a few days. So they went in and liquidated 60 billion euros, and that should send the market down. The question is how much? So those are three of our crashes. And then the other two crashes are what I would call flash crashes. One uh, was a flash crash in 1987 that involved George Soros um, uh, executing a big order at the open of trading. Um, I believe it was the Thursday after the crash. So that would be uh, the George Soros order would be occurring 33 years ago as of today, 
and it was executed at 8 a.m. So exactly when I started lecturing 33 years ago, this George Soros, uh, this George Soros bet, um, I think, started being um, executed. Um, but I think it was Thursday. I may be off by a day. Um, and then the other flash, and it, we call these flash crashes. Um, they have some different characteristics. Um, so in the other uh, uh, flash crash um, was the 2010 flash crash that a joint study by the CFTC and SEC uh, studied very carefully, and they identified a $4 billion sale of futures contracts by one entity um, as a trigger for the event. Um, you, they also did a study, by the way, of the George Soros trades in 1987. They didn't mention George Soros by name, but um, you can uh, see what the quantities are uh, that Soros traded, traded uh, based on the CFTC uh, report um, about that. Um, so in both of these cases, uh, there are two remarkable uh, differences between the previous three. These big crashes involve gigantic positions, like uh, Societe Generale was 60 billion euros. Um, the flash crash was $4 billion. So the flash crash is less than, since the euro is worth more than a dollar, the flash crash is uh, less than 1 15th the size of the Curvy L trade. Um, and the other feature was that the, these uh, flash crashes were compressed into very short periods of time. Um, <laughs> the first three were executed, what I would call quickly, over two or three days. Um, but the, these flash crashes were executed over very short periods of time. Soros was on the open. It was like a market on open order. So it was executed essentially instantaneously on the open. The market declined 20%. Um, and the flash crash was executed, uh, the, the four billion were executed over a, a period of minutes. Uh, I've forgotten the exact number of minutes, but maybe 20 minutes or something like that. Um, so, so here's what we think we learned from these crashes. And I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail as I go along. Uh, the first thing we learn is that the micro-invariance, uh, uh, market microstructure invariance theory that I was talking about, the L, um, gives us essentially a measure of liquidity that can be turned into a measure of market impact by the uh, equation three that I showed. And that kind of fits the, um, uh, especially the first three. Um, but it doesn't fit it perfectly when you try to look at all five of these crashes. And when you look at all five of these crashes, uh, what you need, what you realize is that you need a model that is, let's go back and look at it. You need a model that not only has permanent price impact in it, but also has temporary price impact. And especially to explain what happens in the flash crash, say of 2010, or the other flash crash uh, by Soros, um, you need to explain that, not only why the price crashed, but you need to explain why it bounced right back. And the temporary price impact uh, term here explains both why it would crash more than you would otherwise expect if you traded more slowly, but it also explains why it bounces back essentially immediately um, after the uh, trading stops. So the addition of the smooth trading term, we think, is something on the frontier of market microstructure research. It's something worth thinking about, and it's something that should be uh, uh, looked at uh, more, ca more carefully. Um, so, so the basic idea is equation three here uh, can be, uh, we, we like, uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll talk about it later, but I'm looking at equation three here again. So um, you might, many people worry about what is the shape of the price impact function. Uh, most market microstructure researchers think that price impact is linear um, because most market microstructure models are, are norm, uh, based on normal distributions and linear, uh, um, uh, linearity. And when you have linearity with normal distributions, things remain linear, so that makes price impact linear. And this uh, is totally consider, uh, consistent with linearity because it means linear in Q. And if the a function f is just replaced by a constant, uh, then uh, multiplication by a constant, then you have a linear model, which we think is, is perhaps the right model, probably is the right model, uh, certainly both for L. And we also think it's the right model for K. So at any rate, <laughs> if you are willing to accept uh, linear price impact, then we can ask whether the L that we get from our invariance theory is, is a reasonable um, 
gives, gives us a reasonable um, estimate of transaction costs that would generalize to explain crashes. Okay, uh, let me go back to where I was, um, and I was right here. So uh, I'm gonna run out of time before too long, but um, the uh, if you look at the way uh, people think about market microstructure in the um, academic community, I think it's very ideological, uh, and it's always been very ideological. If you go back uh, to the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you've had kind of two ideological camps that you could call the left and the right, uh, or the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, I'll call them the left and the right. And people on the right believe that markets are efficient and that market prices reflect information. They believe that um, in some sense, the market operates like a, a big uh, brain that aggregates information together and incorporates it into the price and then uh, reveals it to people when they look at uh, prices on the screen. Um, and, and that it's a kind of rational process with a lot of information in the background. So the people on the left tend to think that uh, market prices are the result of human psychology that doesn't necessarily have much to do with really fundamental information and that human beings are subject to all kinds of psychological biases and every psychological bias you can think of could create some kind of weird pattern in prices. Um, this thinking tends to go along with the idea that markets are not, not very efficient. And uh, I would also add that the uh, people on the right tend to think of prices as being market efficiency, implying that prices are not very easy to forecast or returns are not very easy to forecast. Uh, people on the left, the logic of their thinking is that returns should be somewhat um, easy um, to forecast. Um, so we've Miller, Scholz, Fama, Leland, and Rubenstein, they all took the conventional uh, right side politically <coughs> position that was on uh, politically to the right. And they thought that price impact of trading should be essentially zero because they thought that prices essentially re aggregated information instantaneously. Um, and there's no room in there for adverse selection or market impact costs. Um, so um, that's a, a very simplistic way of thinking about markets. But uh, when the crash of 87 occurred, I would have thought that would have destroyed that theory completely, <laughs> but it didn't. Uh, they, uh, they held on to that position, um, you know, including Nobel Prize winners like uh, Merton Miller. Um, they held on to that position even after the 1987 crash. Um, and, you know, Miller pointing out that there's no model of price impact that would explain why uh, the selling by the portfolio insurers uh, would be would lead to, uh, you know, which were a certain number of billions of uh, dollars, would lead to a 30% decline in prices. Um, that, that was what he said, um, but we will contradict that. I want to contradict that in a minute. I, I think that the research that had already been done at the time he was, um, writing this, uh, if we, we had also interpreted it in the um, spirit of invariance, would actually have explained this. Um, so this conventional wisdom, we, um, we interpret to mean that uh, the people on the right think that uh, market, uh, markets are very liquid. And we think of that as meaning the elasticity of demand is, um, price elasticity of demand is elastic, meaning it's uh, greater than one. Um, and uh, that, that would mean if you wanted to trade by 1% of a company's stock, that your price impact should be less than 1%. If you are to sell 1% of a company's stock, your price impact should be uh, less than 1%. Um, so the, the Brady Report reflected this view. Um, <coughs> and the, um, that, that the, price, uh, the price was elastic. Um, so we, we, th we disagree with this. So if you think of it, and we, we, we've been working on revising our crashes paper to try to uh, uh, figure out a better way to explain what's going on. And the, the way that we're thinking about it now is um, that an elasticity of one, uh, it, it certainly will not explain crashes because um, the quantities that were traded were uh, it's not like the portfolio insurers were trying to sell 30% of the stock market capitalization of the United States. There's a much, 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 much smaller fraction of capitalization than that. So um, if you're going to explain stock market crashes from um, a market impact uh, story, 
the elast and you want to call the market impact, uh, you want to relate it to elasticity of demand or elasticity of supply, then the elasticity that you need has to be very low. In other words, demand has to be very inelastic. And instead of being uh, having a, a demand elasticity of one, you need a demand elasticity of like minus 0 0.01. In other words, you need for it to be off by a factor um, of like 100. Um, 100 times, the market impact needs to be 100 times greater than what uh, some of these other researchers uh, used. And indeed, if you look at Schultz's paper, he thought that the elasticity was much, much greater than one. He thought the elasticity might be several hundred. So this idea of what is the elasticity of demand for a stock, even in the year 2020, you have some people who presumably still believe it's, you know, 100 or something, and then other people like me who believe it's one one hundredth. So we're separated by many orders of magnitude uh, in what we uh, think uh, these concepts lead to. So, um, so then the, the way to think about this is how do you get from an elasticity of one to an elasticity of 0 0.01? Right? How do you get the elasticity uh, to be a hundred times smaller than what it might otherwise be? Well, <laughs> I, I don't have any slides about it, but I'm going to sit here and pause and, and talk about it uh, for a second. Um, there are kind of two strands in the literature on trading costs. Uh, one strand goes back to Scholes, but then it also includes additions and deletions of, from the S&P 500. And those uh, those uh, strands of the literature tend to get these, these relatively high elasticities of, of around one or greater. Um, but at the same time, You've had a long tradition going back to Krauss and Stoll and uh, you know, work by Don Keim and uh, uh, people like that um, who look at uh, essentially institutional block trades and they ask what are the uh, price impacts of institutional block trades to the best that we can measure them. And this has been done since the 1960s or 70s. And the numbers that come out of that are numbers that I think are very reasonable <laughs> and they tend to solve half of our problem, but they don't solve the whole, whole problem. They tend to give us elasticities that are not one, but elasticities that are 0 0.1. So they make the elasticity 10 times uh, smaller. And this, uh, you know, typical, uh, you know, a typical price impact of a typical inst big institutional trade might be uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 basis points, depending on whether it's a very liquid or um, illiquid stock that's being traded. And since these, uh, these traders are not trading anything like uh, the corresponding fraction of the company's uh, outstanding shares, they're only trading maybe a tenth that much, you're getting a price impact that's one tenth uh, uh, th the size that, that the, uh, the, the other people might like. Um, so that solves half of our problem. So how do we solve the other half of the problem? How do we get the elasticity from a tenth to a hundredth? And the answer there is that we, we uh, use our market microstructure invariance and we think of it as a way to extrapolate um, the market impact across stocks with different levels of trading activity. So I am going to see if I can find a slide here um, that does this. Here we are. Um, so here's a slide that uh, does what I call the extrapolation. Um, so let's ask the question. I want to trade 5% um, of the daily volume in a typical asset. What is my price impact going to be? And many people would think that my price impact is a function of the fraction of daily volume that I want to trade. So they would say it's going to be a function of that 5% number. If they want to be slightly more sophisticated, they would say it's going to be, uh, this needs to be scaled by the volatility of the asset. So if, if the uh, uh, stock levers itself up and it becomes more volatile, then the price impact measured in basis points will be higher because of leverage and you will get uh, more price impact. So you would ultimately get a, <coughs> a lot of people buying into a theory that says it should be, the price impact should be sigma, that would be a volatility number, multiplied by some function of 5%. Um, now, that sounds okay 
But I think I said earlier, we want to be scientists here. And if we're going to be scientists here, we need to measure things in units that make sense. And the uh, units that make sense here are such that the price impact model that comes out of this is, is what many people call the square root model of price impact, that your price impact is, is not linear, like I think it is, and like most market microstructure researchers think it is. It's not linear in the quantity you trade, but, is, but it is uh, proportional to the square root of the quantity that you trade. So that means that if you go from trading 1% of daily volume to 4%, you have twice as much price impact, not four times as much price impact. Um, <coughs> well, we think that that's, there's something wrong with that theory. Um, and instead, we think that um, there's an alternative uh, solution to this issue. Um, and so let me explain what's going on. If, you understand, if I can explain this picture in a manner that makes sense between now and the end of my lecture, I will consider it to be a success. Um, on the horizontal axis here, we have something called log of W over W star. Uh, w is what we call trading activity. And it's essentially uh, do dollar volume multiplied by return standard deviation. Um, we think that uh, multiplying dollar volume by return standard deviation is a good way to measure the amount of trading activity in the market um, because it has uh, units that, that are strange units, but the units that wind up making sense in the end. And uh, also clearly having more dollar volume suggests higher liquidity, but also having uh, uh, more volatility suggests that a market is exchanging more risk and that's kind of the same thing as uh, very similar to having uh, more dollar volume. So volume, it should be the product of volume and volatility uh, that appears in the formula. Um, so uh, this looks at some uh, data that my co-author Anna Bajrava got when she was a PhD student um, on portfolio transitions. You can just think of them for today's lecture as uh, examples of institutional trades in individual stocks. And the... Um, stocks have a hugely different um, levels of this trading activity variable. And they're plotted here on the horizontal um, axis. So um, the, the vertical axis is what we call a benchmark stock that would correspond to a stock with uh, some arbitrary levels of volume and volatility that we chose, but it was $40 million a day in volume and 2% volatility. If you go below that, which is where most stocks are, um, you're, you have less uh, trading activity for most uh, ticker symbols. Um, if you go above that, you, you of course get most of the stock market capitalization and, mo capitalization and most of the dollar volume in the market because you get uh, most of the S&P 500 to the right. And uh, so what do we have on the uh, vertical axis? Well, on the vertical axis, we have essentially a distribution of what we call bet size. But in particular, it's the distribution or if <laughs> these points rep represent uh, the bets, of these in the, the largest of these institutional bets. So it's essentially something like the top one-tenth of one percent or the top one percent um, of these institutional bets. Um, now we've, we found that these, uh, these bets tend to have something approximating a log normal distribution. So we've taken a log of the size of the bet and we measured the size of the bet as a fraction of average daily volume. So what do you see? You see that the origin here represents trading 100% of, of day's volume in uh, this benchmark stock. And you can see that that hardly ever occurs, but there are three or four cases where that does seem to have happened um, in the data. Um, if you look over to the left, you can see there are lots of cases where for very small stocks, institutions trade more than 100% of one day's volume. And if you look over to the right, you'll see that for the, the bigger stocks that would include the more uh, bigger S&P 500 stocks, it almost never happens that you even come close to trading 100% uh, of one day's volume, except for these odd little points here that I'm pointing at. Um, but the most striking feature of this picture is that although most people's intuition is that you think of about orders and the sizes of orders as a fraction of daily volume, this line, the, the, the blue dots that represent these large orders and stocks with different levels of trading activity, the slope of this line is obviously negative. And 
the uh, what does that mean? That means that large orders um, that are uh, more than 100% of volume or more than any cutoff of volume, say more than 25% of volume, they're much more common in the less actively traded assets than the more actively traded. Um, so as you go into a more, more liquid or more actively traded market, the largest bet that you would expect to see would be um, a very small fraction of the volume. Um, and that's clear from the arrangement of the blue dots here. Now, market microstructure invariance predicts that the slope of the lines that you see here should be <laughs> minus two thirds. And we have uh, made these slopes match the theory. Um, and the reason that the blue lines are one, two, three green lines above the red line is that these are the largest, uh, 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 largest 1% or 0.1% of the institutional trades. If we had picked the median, we would be probably very close to the red line here because the, the red line uh, would be the median with a log normal um, distribution. So this idea of thinking about volume in terms of, uh, I think a price impact in, in terms of percent of daily volume, um, people also use this to describe whether the 1987 crash was going to occur. Uh, another thing to remember is that the SEC started studying the 1987 crash before it occurred. They already written a report on it uh, before it happened, the summer before it happened. It was a very long report. It was like hundreds of pages long. And the reason they had written that report is that there are many people in the market who thought that a crash was going to occur and they had a very specific scenario in mind related to portfolio insurance. So the SEC spelled out the crash scenario in great detail uh, predicting kind of what, what would happen if this scenario were to unfold. They essentially described the stock market crash that did happen perfectly, um, and they did it before it happened, so they, good credit to them for that. But then at the end of the report, they said, we talked to people on Wall Street, and they said, this is not going to happen. Um, so uh, the report came out, and uh, the people interpreted that to mean, well, it's just a scenario that's not going to happen. But then it happened exactly the way the scenario spelled it out. Um, but as people were thinking in 1987 about the 1987 stock market crash, what they did is they extrapolated horizontally, essentially thinking about 5% of trading, 5% of daily volume. Uh, that's, it's a way of extrapolating from small, less active uh, markets to more active markets, but extrapolating horizontally um, along the lines that represent a constant fraction of volume, like 5, 10, 25, uh, or 1%. Um, and yet, we think economically the right extrapolation is along these diagonal lines that represent what invariance uh, would do, would predict. And so what does, uh, <clears throat> what does it mean uh, to extrapolate horizontally and what does it mean to extrapolate diagonally? Well, if you tr extrapolate um, horizontally, uh, what, you're, what you're doing is you're saying, well, a trading 25% uh, trading of average daily volume, and here we've got the red dots for the crashes, and the horizontal um, position is the volume for the market as a whole. So um, trading 25% of volume in the market as a whole, you would think is not going to be very disruptive because if you extrapolate horizontally, you hit a big mass of blue dots that indicate this occurs all the time. Yeah, they're big bets because these are the ones that are selected to be big, but they're not, um, all that unusual and nobody uh, thinks of it as being disruptive to the markets when these blue dots are observed. They don't, um, they don't necessarily generate um, all that much attention. But if you, if you uh, extrapolate in the correct direction, which is diagonally, well then you get a totally different story. You um, extrapolate up the green line diagonally and what you're finding is that you are two or three standard deviations higher than the, the, the size of the very largest bets in uh, these markets. And that's going to suggest that if you believe in linear price impact, that to think about the price impact, you should not think about uh, what's the price impact of uh, trading 25% uh, of average daily volume. And let me now uh, fix, uh, fix that number by adjusting for volatility. Um, it's, it's rather, Let's, uh, let's look, realize that we're several orders of magnitude, or I mean, not several orders of magnitude, but a few standard deviations uh, bigger uh, than the largest bets. 
and the price impact of executing those large bets is going to be many times greater than we thought it would be. Now, I realize this picture is just about the size of the bets, but it, it translates through invariance into predictions about the price impact. So what does invariance do? What invariance does is it allows us to um, make a uh, prediction about how a model of price impact generalizes from individual stocks to the market as a whole. And then what does it say? Well, it, it says that trading 25% of one day's volume in the market as a whole is going to be extraordinarily disruptive. Well, we saw it happen. It happened in 2008 when Societe Generale did exactly that. This is the European market, not the American market. But the 60 billion, I think, was about 25% of volume. At least it says so here based on where the red dot is located. And what happened to the market that day? Well, the market that day, the price in Europe went down 10%. The Fed had an emergency meeting that was not scheduled. The Fed cut uh, the interest rate by 75 basis points. It was kind of an unprecedented cut. Even though the Fed is not supposed to react to specific market events that are based on one particular company, um, it certainly appeared that uh, they were reacting to the market decline that was based on trading uh, of one bet uh, liquidation of uh, Jerome uh, Curviel's trades. And we got a very clean measure, you might think, of the price impact of that, and that is trading 25% would lead to a price impact of 10%. Well, it turns out that 10% is, is pretty close to what invariance would uh, lead you to suspect it would be. So um, so the, uh, the, the bottom line here is that we've got our implication for market crashes. Um, and the way to think about it is think about extrapolating diagonally. And when you extrapolate diagonally, 25% of one day's volume in the market as a whole is a much more serious event than 25% of one day's volume in a typical stock. And essentially what that is saying is that the elasticity of demand for the market as a whole is much lower than the elasticity of demand for an individual stock. Um, and if it if it's, turns out to be about a factor of 10 lower, well, then we've solved our problem. Uh, remember, our problem was that the, uh, the people on the political right think that the, the demand should be elastic. Let's call it elasticity of one. But the, <laughs> the block trade literature says the elasticity is approximately one-tenth if you map it into that. And that's a lower elasticity. It's better able to explain crashes. But to explain crashes, you need an elasticity that's more like 1 100th. And so uh, as you do this uh, diagonal extrapolation, what effectively you're doing is decreasing the elasticity of demand for assets as you increase the level of trading activity in the assets. And up to a rough approximation, you get a tenfold decrease in demand elasticity uh, as you, uh, when you look at the market, uh, the market as a whole compared to a typical individual stock, maybe one along the vertical axis here. So, so our, our invariance theory um, explains a lot of what we need to explain, and it, it allows us to use market microstructure theory to explain what's going on um, in market crashes. Um, so this, this paper has um, lots of other little uh, numbers in it, um, and I'll focus on this table for a second, and then I'll stop. Um, we have numbers that are predicted by invariance here in red. We have numbers predicted by what we call the conventional wisdom, that's the high elasticity in green. And then we have the actual numbers in blue. <laughs> and what you can see is the market crash of 29, um, we predicted a bigger crash than you actually got. The market crash of 87, we predicted a big crash, but, but it's a bit smaller than what you actually got. Um, for the Societe Generale trades, uh, we predicted a, a, a crash of about 12%. What you got was 9%. So we think that there's a rough order, first order approximation. That's pretty good uh, numbers. Um, and, but then we were way off on the flash crashes. So for the Soros trades, the price declined 22%, uh, but we would have predicted only seven. And that's stretching it by using a very high volatility number. Um, and the flash crash, we would have predicted a decline of about 50 basis points, which nobody would have really noticed. Um, instead, it was like 5%. So even 
with the order of magnitudes that I talked about, getting it from 1 to 0.1 to 0.01, the, uh, <coughs> you need to get to 0.001 to explain the flash crash of 2010. So what do we um, think we learn from looking at the discrepancies between these different columns? First, we think that the conventional wisdom is pretty much useless. Um, but second, we think that uh, the di discrepancies between the red numbers and the blue numbers are su suggestive of directions for research in market microstructure. Um, we think that temporary price impact was very important in these flash crash events, and it shows up exactly in these discrepancies here, particularly for the 2010 flash crash. The actual price decline was much bigger than we would predict, even with invariance uh, making the prediction be quite large. And we think the reason is that our invariance predictions do not take into account the speed with which the bet uh, was executed. And this uh, $4 billion bet is very small relative to Curviel's 60 billion euro bet. This $4 billion bet was executed so fast that its uh, price impact was much greater, 5%. But then, of course, it reversed immediately thereafter, which is consistent with temporary price impact. So we think temporary price impact is important for understanding that data point. And the same story can be told about Soros's trades in 87. Uh, we used a very high uh, return variance. It was hard to measure what return variance was during the week after the flash crash. But you still got the actual decline much greater than what we would have predicted. Um, and well, what about the big crashes, which kind of fit our model uh, kind of well? Well, we think that the 2008 Societe, Societe Generale trades fit it, uh, the, the assumptions fit better than any of the others. And the results actually fit better as well, like 9% is not that different from 12%. But what was different about what was going on in 29 and 87 that made the 29 crash smaller than what we thought it should have been, but made the 87 crash bigger than what we thought it should have been. And the answer we think is the way the market mechanism works. And it'll let me end talking about uh, things like trading halts and price, price limits and circuit breakers. But what I think the, the more important issue really is, is what I would call liquidity backstops. In 1987, the big banks all got together and put together essentially a fund to support the market and then announced that they had put together this fund and said uh, we will essentially finance inventories through the banking system that we haven't been financing and we'll give people who were trying to sell more time to liquidate their trades and the result was that the 29 crash got stretched out over a period of months rather than compressed into a few days and we think what that did is reduce the size of the 29 crash. If they had not done that, it would have been uh, uh, more catastrophic uh, than it otherwise was. And so um, in the 87 crash, it was exactly the opposite. The financial system was actually pretty robust in 1929, not very robust in 1987. And as time passes, it becomes less and less robust. So, you know, right now we don't have a financial system at all. We have the federal government. Uh, and the financial system is the Fed, um, because all risk has been transferred uh, to the Fed via the sort of what people call the Greenspan put. In 87, there was some uncertainty about uh, what was going on, but the market mechanism fell apart. People were doubting whether the CME would survive. You know, it survived just fine, but people weren't sure that it would survive. You could see that they weren't sure because they, they kind of took positions that they would have kept on the exchange in normal times off the exchange and turn them into uh, bilateral swaps. Um, and so we think that the decline in 1987 was exacerbated by uh, bad things happening to um, the market mechanism, that it seemed to be falling apart and that uh, allowed prices to decline uh, more than they would have declined. So uh, an important issue for research and market microstructure and, and an important research also for macroeconomics and economics in general is understanding these crash events and using them as uh, examples to learn about how markets work. Um, and what we think we've learned uh, from our research so far is that making a distinction between permanent and temporary price impact is important. Um, it's also most important, and the main theme of the crash paper is using invariance to extrapolate from one stock to another. You want to extrapolate diagonally and not horizontally. Um, and when you extrapolate diagonally, you solve a lot of your problem um, and you make the results uh, of these crash events 
uh, rather uh, understandable or predictable uh, based on what happened. Okay, I 